Imagine showing up for jury duty and finding out that you might have a front row seat for the next several months to be the first criminal trial of the former president and that you could be one of the people who will decide if Donald Trump should be a convicted felon and potentially shape his political fate. And while you're being questioned, there is the guy sitting right there whose stock and trade has often been intimidation throughout his career. Well, that was what greeted 96 Manhattanites on a beautiful spring day here in New York today. It's a bit chillier, though, in the courtroom. At one point, every available seat in that courtroom gallery and the jury box was filled. But at about the time it takes to say hush money, at least 50 prospective jurors were told that they could leave. They had raised their hand and said they could not be fair and impartial in this trial. Judging from today's proceedings, it could take a while to find the 12 who believe that they can, and a few alternates. As for Trump, our CNN team inside the courtroom tells us that he was actually biting his lip during today's proceedings, not just literally and figuratively as well, only uttering three words out loud inside that courtroom. Outside court, however, it was a very different story. My son has graduated from high school, and it looks like the judge will not let me go to the graduation of my son, who's worked very, very hard. Next Thursday, we're before the United States Supreme Court at a very big hearing on immunity. And this is something that we've been waiting for a long time. And the judge, of course, is not going to allow us. He thinks he's superior, I guess, to the Supreme Court. And we got a real problem with this judge. I should note the judge that Trump is referring to there, Judge Juan Mershon, has not actually ruled yet on his request to be excused from the court for his son's graduation, which is next month. He did tell Trump, though, that he will be required to be in court next week on Thursday when those immunity arguments are going to be happening at the Supreme Court. While acknowledging that the Supreme Court is a big deal and it certainly is significant that those arguments will be taking place next week, the judge reminded Trump's team that the former president is a criminal defendant here in New York, and his presence in that courtroom, as it was today, is required. My source tonight was inside that courtroom and has reported on Trump for decades and wrote the biography of him, Confidence Man, senior political correspondent for The New York Times and CNN's political analyst Maggie Haberman is here. And Maggie, I mean, just what a fascinating place to be reporting from today. What was it like inside the courtroom? I mean, look, I, we were all, I think, very conscious that we were covering history. This was uh, the first trial, first criminal trial of a former U.S. president. This was the beginning of jury selection. It didn't get very far in. There were a bunch of motions in the morning. Uh, but it was really striking watching Trump in this cavernous courtroom, a very, very dingy courtroom, I might add, not at all like the federal courthouses that he has, you know, become accustomed to in some of his indictments and some of his civil cases. The, the, the courtroom in 100 Center Street is really dirty, and it's really evocative of the New York that he grew up in, frankly, and pretty familiar with, but he is sitting there surrounded by initially 96 prospective jurors, and it has a minimizing effect on a guy who projects largeness and strength as often as he can. And so that was striking. He was actually on fairly good behavior compared to what we have seen in other cases and how he acted certainly in his civil cases. He has been warned by his lawyers that he could get himself in a lot of trouble, not just with the judge, but with jurors. I don't think jurors in the Carroll case liked it when he stormed out during closing arguments. We will see if he sticks to that. But it was a it was a remarkable day. I, I mean, you've covered him for so long. And to see him in that setting, you know, you've covered him when he's in the Oval Office. You've covered him on the campaign trail. To see him in a courthouse, what was he doing when those 96 potential jurors came in the room? Was he looking around at them? It's a great question. I mean, he was, he was craning his neck to see them. In some cases, he seemed to be trying to make eye contact, which is something that he did in the Carroll case. He kept sort of scanning jurors' faces and trying oh, to connect. Oh, he was connect. trying to look at them. He directly. was trying to connect, yeah. And in this case, when they were first, you know, they're, they're, the question was, do you think you can't be fair in this case? I'm paraphrasing. Um, and it wasn't, you know, a giant show of hands. It was row by row, but it was more than 50 people who ultimately ended up leaving of this pool of 96. And Trump had the juror questionnaire in front of him as the others were then being questioned. He did look around the room as people were raising their hands and listing their, their jury number. They don't give their names. Uh, and then saying that they were leaving. Um, you know, he seemed um, weary of it by the end of it, frankly. I mean, he seemed bored and fidgety, as we have seen him any number of times. He often can't sit still. Um, but I, I think this is going to be one of the most interesting jury selection 
processes we've seen in a long time. Was he reading along the questionnaire? Mm -hmm. He was because the way it would work is the jurors who were asked questions or asked to answer the questionnaire were seated in the jury box and then they would just go down with the answers without saying what the question was in the interest of time because this is such an expansive juror questionnaire. So unless you had it in front of you, you didn't really know what they were responding to until many of them said what their news reading habits were. And he was reading along to see what they were talking about. And, you know, I was thinking about that today. He's always also in control of his own time before the White House. But certainly when you're the president of the United States, you control basically what where you want to go, what you want to do. I wonder what you think it's going to be like for him to to be under such time constraints of having to be in the courtroom during those Supreme Court immunity arguments next week, during other opportunities and things that he wants to be doing. It's going to be frustrating for him, I think, on two fronts, uh, three fronts. Number one, what, as you said, he's not going to be able to go campaign the way he wants to campaign. He's not going to be able... Now, he has found some political benefit uh, in these court cases, but we might be seeing the max out effect of what that looks like, depending on what happens in the trial. If he gets a hung jury in this trial, then that could look very different in terms of how it plays politically. But for argument's sake, his folks are, are preparing for a, a possible conviction. Um, number two, he, as I said before, gets bored easily. He fidgets a lot. He, he has to sit there. He can't be on his phone. He can't look at Truth Social. He can't, you know, do the normal things that he does. So that, I think, is going to be taxing for him. And then there's this thing where his words are essentially weapons against him. So the thing I was really struck by in the morning was he had to sit there, and there were all these motions in the morning that were mm -hmm. dealt with before we got to the beginning of jury selection. And in several of them, prosecutors were reading his old tweets from when he was president. And there were a series of tweets about Michael Cohen uh, from April of 2018. And it was Michael Cohen will never flip. And then they used it to compare tweets later after Michael Cohen was pro uh, cooperating with prosecutors. And he said something, it, the, the tweet was essentially, if you're looking for a skilled lawyer, don't hire, hire Michael Cohen. That was the only time I saw Trump really laugh, by the way, was at his own words. But he also had to sit there as they read the transcript of the Access Hollywood tape. Not all of it, but much of it. That's what a lot of this trial is going to be. You know what I noticed, speaking of that, is, you know, Melania Trump's not there. Right. Right. This case, for all we talk, we'll talk about the legal theories with Trump's attorney who's coming on in, in a moment. But personally for him, it also has an impact because it certainly did when the story was coming out mm -hmm. and we were learning all the details of this. There's no question. And he's been saying to people privately, you know, the, referencing his wife in connection with this trial about it. It, this is, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that it's not pleasant. Uh, she was very unhappy when they were in the White House. She made that very clear uh, through a number of people. Um, I don't expect that you will see her at this trial. Uh, I, you know, we haven't seen her at any of these uh, cases. Uh, but uh, I do think that the personal effect of this that you're talking about is really the biggest one for him. It's a question mark as to whether even if he's convicted, he would get jail time as a first-time mm -hmm. nonviolent uh, offender. Uh, but he hates this case and just wants it to go away.